foothills, my name's Dan, so good to be with you, I'm going to wait to stand, I'm going to lift our voices together. The Lord my God is with me, He's the mighty one who saves me, in my fear and in my loneliness, He surrounds me with His love.
Zephaniah 3, the Lord your God is with you. He's a mighty Savior. He delights in you with gladness. He calms all your fears and renews you with His love. He rejoices over you with joyful songs. Do you believe that? Your God rejoices over you with joyful songs. You may be here this morning and feel like, I have to sing. God started it. It was His idea. Our song is just a response to His song of love over us, the church, His bride, and the world. And we get to be a part of that. Isn't that good news? Amen. My name is Dan Optum. I'm the worship pastor here. So good to be with you. So good to hear you start to sing a little bit. We're going to do a bit more of that as well. If you're new, extra big warm welcome to you. A few things specifically for you. Free specialty drink from Gathering Grounds, which is our coffee shop in the lobby. Let them know you're new. It's your first time and they will hook you up. We'd like you to get to know us. We'd like to get to know you. Here's a good first step in both those directions. One is the connect cards that are on or around your seat. Fill that in, drop it in a giving box on your way out. That's a good opportunity for us to get to know you. And then today being the third Sunday of the month, we do the intro, uh, which is a great way for you to find out about us. Follow the signs after this service and it'll be about 10 to 12 minutes of your time. You'll hear about Foothills what we're about, you'll meet some of the team and it will be good and 10 to 12 minutes, it won't take much of your time either. So we're going to sing a bit more. We have, uh, we're in the middle of a series called Whole Heart Relationships and we are thinking about how to love one another in the relationships in which we find ourselves and to help us do that, we're focusing with our heart, soul, mind and strength on God's love for us. And so we're going to pray along with the Apostle Paul that we together would know how wide and how long, how high and how deep God's love is for us, for His church and for the world. Let's keep singing together. Gave us 
us his one and only son to save.
good, you are good When there's nothing good in me You are love, you are love On display for all to see You are light, you are light When the darkness closes in You are hope, you are hope You have covered all my sin You are peace, you are peace When my fear is crippling You are true, you are true Even in my wandering You are joy, you are joy You're the reason that I sing You are life, you are life And you death is lost its sting Every voice I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world.
So God, open our ears to hear your song of love over us. And may redeeming love be our theme, the theme of our lives now and into eternity because you have loved us so well, so extravagantly. Open our eyes, open our hearts to know deeply how wide and how long, how high and how deep your love is for us, for your church and for this world. And because we've been loved so well, may we be free to love those around us because we've got nothing to lose and nothing to prove because the riches of your love are enough for us. So we wanna be good at loving, loving our neighbours, good at loving our enemies and we need your help to be those kind of people. And we stand in solidarity with those in our community around the world who are suffering. We think of uh, Israelis and Palestinians and Iranians and others affected by war right now. And in the face of oppression, violence, those cycles that just keep going. We pray for peace. We come to you as our Father. We say, how long, O oh Lord? Have mercy on us. Bring peace in us, in our community, around this world. Because you love this world and we love this world. Give our leaders wisdom and put our hope once again in the return of our King who's gonna come and put all things to right again. Hallelujah. Come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. As dearly loved children, brothers and sisters, all God's people together with one voice say, Amen. So good to be with you. The gospel reconciles us to God and to one another. So I'm not gonna say anything about the nuggets, you know, you know what's happening. But I'm gonna give you a moment to say hi to the people around you. Maybe you can ask them what's going on if you don't know. Tell them you're glad they're here. If you're watching online, glad you're with us as well. Hang tight, we'll come back together real soon. Welcome. At FBC, our mission is to help people become faithful followers of Jesus. And here are some ways that we carry that out. Starting off today, we have some exciting news. We're launching something brand new this summer at FBC called Summer Quest. It's like VBS and Adventure Camp rolled into one awesome, amazing, spectacular, unthinkable, unexplainable experience. It's gonna be pretty cool. For kids, three, to kindergarten, we've got VBS style fun lined up. And for the older kids, they can pick up electives they're into. Plus, they'll all learn more about Jesus throughout the week. It's happening June 10th to the 14th, and trust us, it's gonna be awesome. We still need a ton of volunteers, so if you're great at running electives, or you love greeting people, or you just wanna help keep an eye on things around campus, we have the perfect role for you. And if you volunteer, you'll get a discount when you register your child, Registrations are underway now, so swing by the lobby table or hop on our website to volunteer or register your kiddo for SummerQuest. Okay, we have something really fun coming up. Check this out. Attention all lovebirds. Are you ready to ignite the spark in your relationship? Well, listen up. Research says that spending quality time together boosts happiness and communication. What a better way to do that than with a date night. We're having a fun evening of romance and connection coming up. For just $20, you'll receive a delightful date night box filled with surprises and conversation starters to keep the fun alive. And hey, parents, we've got you covered. Drop your kiddos off at the church for a fun-filled night while you invest in your relationship. 
Whether you're dating or married, young or old, there's something for everyone at FBC Date Night. Sign up now and be part of the movement for wholehearted relationships. We'll give you some ideas and starters in your date night box. You come up with the rest. Sign up online today and then just show up on April 26th. Don't miss out. This night is going to be so much fun and it's just a fun excuse for a date night with that special someone. It's easy to sign up and pay online and then pick up your date night box starting at 5.30 p.m. till 6 p.m. this Friday, April 26th. You'll take some fun prom style pictures and then head out together on your romantic evening. For you parents doing date night, drop off your little ones for a blast downstairs. We've got crafts, games, pizza, and a movie for the kids up to sixth grade. Pick them up between 8.30 and 9 p.m. It's just $5 per kid, max $15 per family. You can't beat that. Sign up in the lobby or on our website. Hey, that's all we have for you today, FBC. For more info on all of this and to stay in the loop more easily, make sure you're getting our weekly emails. To subscribe, you can fill out a Connect card with your info or you can visit our website and just scroll down to the bottom of the page and hit Get Email Updates. Have a great day, everyone. Hey everybody, morning. So glad you guys are here. Uh, so look, we're in a five-week series called Whole Heart Relationships. And so the biblical foundation that we're working from is, uh, it starts here, right? Is that God loves us with a whole heart. Like all of the love that he wants to pour into it, the line is like thick and exaggerated to hopefully make the point. Like this is not like a little bit of love. This is just a flood of his love. And the highest priority in life is this. God wants you to receive his love. That's the highest priority right there, right? Take it in deeply. Allow that to transform us. You literally can't move past this. You can't say this too much. You can't emphasize it too much. In response, what God wants from us is then to love him in return. Right. And, you know, we're, people are always like, well, what do I do? Like, what do I say? Like, how how does that look in my life? And the most important thing from from God wants from us, he's like, hey, love me. That's what I want more than anything. That was our first sermon in this series. If you miss it, I'd recommend you watch it online. Now, listen, consider how Jesus answered the question when he was asked, well, what's the greatest commandment? Right? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. That is us loving him. That's what he wants. Like people get all kinds of ideas of like, oh, I bet God wants this. Oh, I bet God wants that. He first and foremost, he wants you to love him in return. Then the verse goes on to say how loving, receiving love from him and then loving him back, how that will then change all of our other relationships. Continuing Matthew 22, verse 39, he says, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And neighbor here is going to be everybody that we share life with, everybody we're rubbing shoulders with. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. So what happens then in our drawing is, that now we're clarifying, okay, there's a relational connection now between me and my neighbor, me and everyone else around me in life, that he's also wanting me to love them like God loves me. So last week, we looked at whole heart singleness. What does that look like? If you're not married, we're going to look at marriage today. Well, what does that look like to love your neighbor? What does that look like to like receive from the Lord and no contentment? So today, as we look at marriage, whole heart marriage, the reason this, these are both important for us to do as a church family is we've got a bunch of people in our church that are single and a bunch of people in our church that are married. We're all the family of God, right? That's a, that's a healthy family of God. And 
if, if you're single but want to become married, well, some things that I'm going to talk about today will hopefully give you some instruction on what that should look like. Maybe you're going to hear what I have to say today, singles, and you're going to think, yeah, I don't think I want that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not in for that. If you're already married, you can't think that, okay? <laughs> you're in. You're already in. And if you need help, and you want some encouragement from some of the stuff I'm saying, we have a great marriage ministry and we'd love to like connect you with some coaches and like help, co um, help you along the way. Because God has given us a pretty remarkable plan for both singleness and marriage, depending on which season of life you're in. So let's pray and then we're gonna jump into God's word together. So God, your love for us is staggering during this life, we, we're never even going to fully understand it. But you're gracious and good enough to us to help us understand it a little more deeply and a little more deeply. And we long for that. And then we want to love others like you've loved us. And so as we look now at what does whole heart marriage look like, would you speak to us? Our, our hearts are soft we want to be taught by you and your word, God, so teach us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so I've got a few questions I'm gonna to answer today. First question, what was God's original design for marriage? To get the answer, we're gonna go all the way back to Genesis chapter one, and we're gonna look at creation. As God was creating everything in Genesis chapter one, he kept repeating a phrase, it is good. Animals, lights, sea animals, all of it. Good, 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 good. Only once did God differ from this cause and effect in creation, and that was when he made man. Genesis 2, 18 tells us, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Make note, a mental note, or even write it down of that word helper. It's a very important word. I'm gonna circle back to that later. So guys, in, in order to make humanity good, the best it could be, God created woman for man and gave these instructions later, Genesis chapter two, verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So this relationship was not a casual friendship, they weren't just neighbors. This is perfect covenant love. God wove the deepest intentional horizontal relationship connection between men and women originally. And you'll often hear these verses at a wedding, right? And we feel, we feel like a little warm and fuzzy. We feel hopeful for love. Right? There's no shame here, there's no fear, and there's no rejection. There's no hurtful words, there's no judgment. There's no need for forgiveness because you've got two sinless people. So question number two, how did humanity break this design? While God designed marriage as a wonderful thing, we see in Genesis three, how the sin of Adam and Eve ruined it along with everything else when they rebelled against God. This is the part that is never read at a wedding. Um, <laughs> after, because <in> <laughs> it's not warm and fuzzy. Uh, Genesis 3.16, God's speaking to Eve. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband and he shall rule over you. So women, your desire is going to be contrary to your husband, and then the husband is going to want to rule over. John Piper has a great description of this. I'm just going to read it. These outworkings of sin mean that when sin has the upper hand in woman, she would desire to overpower or subdue or exploit man. And when sin has the upper hand in man, he will respond in like manner with his strength, subdue her or rule over her. So what is really described here is the ugly conflict between the male and the female that has marked so much of human history. Maleness, as God created it, 
has been depraved and corrupted by sin. Femaleness, as God created it, has been depraved and corrupted by sin. The essence of sin is self-reliance and self-exaltation. First in rebellion against God and then in exploitation of each other. See, when Adam and Eve severed their whole heart relationship with God, they also severed and ruined their ability then to relate back to God the way God had designed, and they severed and ruined the relationship they were supposed to have with each other the way God had designed it. And humanity has been struggling with this and the aftershocks of it ever since. See, we have this remnant of a longing for God's perfect design within us, but we're ensnared with the effects of sin within our hearts. But there is good news. God was not done with us and he was not done with marriage. God said, in essence, this is not a quote, this is an implication of what we see in scripture, God says, I will not allow you to completely ruin my beautiful creation. I'm going to partially redeem marriage through the purifying work of the Holy Spirit made possible by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so what, what happened then is we can make these little severings into a cross now and that the cross now provides a new way for humanity to receive and understand the full love of God. He allows us now to react and relate back to him with a whole heart, right? Everybody has the cross as their way now to relate both receiving and giving back to God. And because of the cross, we can give and receive love like we, we would never have been able to do without the cross. What a mercy and grace that is to us from God. See, so God's partially redeemed plan for marriage is through the cross. Marriage won't ever complete you, but it, it's good. Marriage is not the purpose of your life, but it's good. A person can go no great contentment being single. Yeah. And if you desire to be married, it's good. And note, I'm describing marriage here as partially redeemed because it's not going to be fully redeemed during this life. Meaning we can't get back to God's original design for marriage. The sin damage brought to marriage has this lasting effect that we all will wrestle with. But the design is still good. Now, what we see now in the New Testament is a description of what is this new partially redeemed plan look like? Like how, how does God want husbands and wives to interact with and relate to each other? We're gonna go to Ephesians chapter five to see this new plan. Now, hold on. Before we read the verses, don't look at the screens. Look at me. <laughs> I'm going to just read these verses from God's Word, Ephesians chapter 5. It's about the roles of wives and the roles of husbands. Some of you are going to think to yourself something like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm just going to say that. Would you just give me like 20 minutes after I read it? The plan that God has here is actually beautiful. It's redeeming. It's full of value for both men and women. But a lot of people have misrepresented these verses and have messed it all up. No surprise there. We live in a sinful world, okay? So let me read them. Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 22. It says this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Verse 33, and this is continuing with husbands' instructions. Husbands, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is God's word. Now, all right, third question here. What is God's blueprint for partially redeemed marriages? Well, God is now clarifying a very surprising and glorious way for husbands and wives to relate to each other. Wives motivated by love submit. Husbands motivated by a heart of love lead. So there we have the two roles, submit and and lead. Both husbands and wives want to make marriage about them. That's natural. That is the sin nature that we are born with. Everybody has it. And God is saying, it's not about you. It's about how you serve and selflessly love one another. And there's a gift in this, although it looks difficult and Some would say it looks too difficult and some would even say it seems unappealing. Well, if you want to thrive and live in the best whole heart marriage, this is your blueprint. So let's look at both roles. We're going to look at the role of the wife and then look at the role of the husband. We'll take the role of the wife first because she's mentioned first. Verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, um, as the church submits to Christ, so also the wife should submit in everything to their husband. So the role of the wife is to submit in love. What that means is, in the Greek, that means to voluntarily put yourself under. So it's voluntary. And yes, there is, uh, there's, a, there's an order of authority. Yes, that's what it means. It means to arrange yourself under someone for a good and proper purpose. Now the word submit is a bit of a triggering word because a lot of wrong ideas come to mind when you hear that word and I want to try to redeem it today. Ladies, so listen, submit has nothing to do with lowering your value or worth. Nothing. It also doesn't say women submit to all of the men everywhere all the time. I literally, like this weekend, so I don't know how these things pop up on my phone, but a a video popped up. It was an interview. And the person was using Ephesians chapter 5 to make his defense of a case that he believes that women in America should not have the right to vote Have you ever heard this? I had never heard this in my life. I was very intrigued because I knew I was preaching this passage. (laughs) And I'm thinking, that doesn't sound like the passage interpretation that I'm preaching. The idea being that she's supposed to submit and the husband is the head of the house and so his vote will represent her. I thought, man, no wonder women, Christian, godly women have spoken up and said, that's not what that means. See, there's nothing in this word that has to do with being dominated or marginalized. It is your role on the marriage team. That's the, what it is. Husbands and wives, they're equal in value, but they do play different roles on the team. And look, over the centuries, too many men have constructed wickedly sinful ideas of submit and then use that to justify taking advantage, abusing and marginalizing their wives and women in general. That behavior has nothing to do with God's redeemed plan for marriages, nothing. The best way to understand the role of submission is this. You come to the aid of someone 
who has been given primary responsibility. In a marriage, the husband has been given primary responsibility and the wife comes as an aid, as a helper to help him and to help the family. This is key to understanding the whole construct. Although it's talking about wives here specifically, this is not limited to females in the Bible. In fact, the Bible instructs everyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ to submit to everyone else in the church. That's Ephesians 5, verse 21. That's literally the verse right before it says, wives, submit to your husbands. It says, everybody submit to everybody. Men, women, kids, singles, married, it doesn't matter, divorced, widowed, everybody submit to everybody in the church. Jesus submitted He submitted to the will of the Father while he was on earth. John 5.30 tells us how Jesus submitted. And you think about it. Well, Jesus probably did it with joy, didn't he? He says this, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is just one of many, many examples of how Jesus submitted himself to God the Father. Now, we can also connect this role of submitting back to God's original design in Genesis. So in Genesis 2.18, remember I told you that God created Eve to be Adam's helper. That word helper in Hebrew is a beautiful word. It's the word sukhaur in Hebrew. It's a role of help and support. This is not insulting, nor is this demeaning. God himself is called the same thing in the Old Testament, a helper and a supporter to the people of Israel throughout the Old Testament. Psalm 33, 20 tells us, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Same exact word, sukar. Psalm 70, verse 5, But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help, my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. And so, guys, since God himself filled this role of being the helper of people in Israel, clearly this is not an inferior role. This is not a marginalized role. This is a role filled with dignity and honor and great importance. So let me try to get practical here. I want to give you some examples. Some examples in a marriage of a wife fulfilling her role to be a helper, a sukhauer, being submissive. So a wife actively watches for areas of need and improvement in the family. A wife strategizes plans, takes action to help her husband as he leads. It's hard to lead because leaders make mistakes. And then what do you do when a leader makes mistakes and you're like under a leader? What, don't you look at him and think, well, why did you do that? That was dumb. <laughs> leaders are criticized all the time. A wife prays for her husband to lead like Jesus. A wife enthusiastically responds to her husband leading and doing his best, encourages and cheers on, and is proactive in helping her husband lead and leading with him and providing for the family. See, in all of these kinds of ways, and man, there are many, many more ways of examples. Like this is the role of a wife submitting to her husband and filling this role as a helper. Wives, when you live according to this design, you will experience new mercies and fresh grace in your relationship with your husband. It will even deepen your understanding of how God loves you. So yes, it comes here and then it flows there. Yes, it also flows back and forth here and then we realize, oh, that's interesting. 
as I deal with this sinful person here, I'm being reminded of how I am the sinful person that God is loving in a lavish, magnificent way. We shouldn't dis discard this model because it, our flesh resists it. There's a mercy and a fresh grace within it. So that's the role of the wife. Let's look at the role of the husband. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So the role of the husband is to lead with love. Now, there are two key concepts from these verses. It says, it uses the word head. The husband is the head of the wife. That Greek word is kephale. Um, it was a very prominent word in their culture. Um, and it, what it means is that there is a person who bears primary responsibility. It's not authority that is to be abused to just get your way. That could be a version of kephal, but that's not what God's talking about here because he's, he's giving this qualifier. He says the husband should love his wife like Jesus loves the church. So that's why when you, you put both of those key concepts together, the husband is to lead with love, sacrificial love. Clarification on this is very important because there's a cultural influence in our country today to either diminish or exaggerate the husband's role to lead. Some will say, no, you don't get to be the leader. Husbands or wives are gonna to be totally equal in authority. That's diminishing their role. In other examples, men take verses like this or they just mix it together with some cocktail of like cultural influence and think, oh, well, I can just do everything I want because I'm the man. Neither are God's redeemed design. And let's just think about God's brilliance here. He knew that man would be inclined because of the sin within him, going all the way back to Genesis 3.16, to abuse his authority over his wife. God knew that. And he knew that wives would respond by demanding equal authority to lead within their marriage. So God built in this qualification of how a husband should lead his wife. He says, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave his life for us. See, leadership looks amazing when you think you're going to get all kinds of perks for it like power, money, like praise. You're like, oh, I want the leadership. And then when you add in the way Jesus, you're like, oh, well, just for clarification, the role is to lead, yes. That means you bear primary responsibility, yes. And you're gonna do it like Jesus loved the church. And then everybody's like, well, somebody else could lead, that would be fine, you know, I mean. If that's the call. I mean, think about how Jesus' love was expressed to people. In conversations he had with people, you ever notice he's always asking questions. Like, why did he do that? He knew the answers. Because he's trying to lead them with his questions to something better, and he was gentle and he was kind as he did it a loving leader. In his kindness and his love, he used his power to heal people and to perform miracles. He was not doing that because he wanted to be popular. He, he didn't want to become famous. He wasn't doing it to become rich. He was using his power to lead, motivated by serving love. In humility, he trained the disciples to take over after he left, right? He was the leader, yes. He led the disciples. He created the whole training program. And then he said, now I trust you to implement it. I'm, I'm gonna let you guys become the leaders. And then he ultimately showed it 
in his unconditional and sacrificial death on the cross, dying for us. See, this type of loving servant leadership is how God has designed it for men to love their wives. It is nothing like a dictator or a tyrant. It's servant leadership. So let me get practical. Let me try to give some examples of this. A husband lovingly plans and protects. A husband is lovingly attentive to the emotional and spiritual needs of his wife and his family. A husband lovingly initiates to pray and to give biblical wisdom. He affirms the self-esteem, beauty, and usage of the spiritual gifts of his wife and his family. Husband weighs the emotional elasticity and durability of the family when making decisions. And in these kinds of ways, and there are obviously many, many, many more, the husband is leading his wife and his family in love, filling his role. Husbands, when we live according to God's design, you'll experience new mercies and fresh grace in your relationship with your wife. And it will awaken within you deeper understandings of God's love for you as well. Look, both roles that God has given us in marriage, submitting in love and leading in love are difficult. Both of them go against our sinful flesh. And I would say that being in a thriving, ongoing, ever deepening, growing relationship with God is your fuel to then love your spouse the way God has intended us to love our spouses. Now, let me just give you some examples of what this can look like from people that I've known through the years and some, uh, one example from my own life. When I was a student in seminary, one of the professors mentioned that he used to be a pastor full-time at a church. And he left that role and became a professor in the seminary. I was very intrigued by that. Um, so I went and I was meeting with him. I was dating my wife, um, pondering engagement to Cassie, who now is my wife. And I was very intrigued by some of his story. And I went and asked him, I said, hey, like, tell me more about that. Why did you leave pastoral ministry at the church? And he said, well, um, I did it for, it was well over a decade. And the spiritual and emotional demands upon my wife were too much. So, how do you love like Jesus? leader, servant leader. He's, his answer was, well, I resigned my job at the church and I took a job still ministering and developing up Christian leaders in a seminary because it had a lighter spiritual and emotional load on my wife. He laid down his job preference and he didn't hold it against her because he embraced his role to lead with love. That was very impactful on me. Second example. It was very clear I was gonna be leaving my job as a pastor in Orlando. I was stressed and I was overwhelmed. We had a new baby and my wife was pregnant with our second baby. It's not good timing to be getting a new job. But I was definitely getting a new job. The future was very, very unclear. And I remember talking with my wife about it and expressing my fears. And she says, it's gonna be okay. I'll follow you to the ends of the earth. We'll be okay. So what was she doing? She was laying down her preferences for stability and security and did not hold it against me as we were forging out into an adventure, right? She was embracing her role to submit with love. All right, here's your third example. Randy wanted to buy a new car. 
It's a very awesome car. They could afford it. Um, it was going to stretch the budget, but they could afford it, right? So um, they were chatting about it, and they, they went to drive the car together, test drive the car, talked about it. And Randy, he's like, I definitely think we should buy this car. And his wife said, I don't think we should buy this car. So uh, one of them suggested, well, why don't we pray about it for a week and then we'll talk again. So that's what they did. They come back together after a week and they still disagree about buying the car. Someone very wise said, why don't we pray for a month? Come back together and then let's see what happens. They prayed for a month, got back together, still disagreed. How does a Christian couple resolve this, right? Big financial decisions. How do we resolve this? The husband has the role of loving leader. The wife has the role of being a, a, a loving follower, a helper, a submissive person, and a leader. But thoughtful and accommodating. Like, how, how does that work out at this point? Right, Randy shared his vision, buying the new car. Looks awesome, we can afford it. His wife honestly shared her opinion and said, I don't think this is a good idea. Right, there's a dance to these things, guys. In every marriage, with every personality involved in every marriage, there's a dance involved in this. So they still disagreed after a month. What decision is made and who makes it? That's really the answer. You know what I've heard a lot? In churches, I've heard the phrase, happy wife, happy life. I can't find that verse in the Bible, <laughs> by the way. I'm not saying there's not some some wisdom in that. But that could be used in a very unhealthy, non-biblical way. A decision of some sort is going to be made. Whether the decision is, let's just postpone it, or we're just going to go buy it, right? A decision is going to be made in this scenario. So you, here's what Randy did. He thought about it. He had the humility to, to recognize that his wife's track record on big financial decisions is better than his own. So, he laid down his preference and he made a decision that he disagreed with. And he did not buy the car and he didn't hold it against his wife because he was just embracing his role to lead with love as a servant leader. Submitting in love and leading in love will bring a vibrancy and an intimacy to marriage if you will embrace them. This is God's blueprint for whole heart marriage. And guys, let's be a church that has the wisdom to disregard cultural norms and embrace God's redeemed plan. It's good for us, it's good for our spouses, it's good for our kids, and it's good for this world. And empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can do this. Would you bow your heads and let's pray together? Jesus, we marvel at your, your ways and your plans. They are always beyond us, in and of ourselves. Like, we couldn't come up with a plan like this. But you made the plan, and you also empower us by your Spirit to live it. And so I just want to pray for all of the married couples that they would listen to your voice as you lead each of us, show us the next step to fulfill our roles. 
I pray for all of the singles. Lord, would you give them a great sense of contentment in the season they are in? And if they desire a Christian marriage, would you show them, tutor them, and prepare them for that future time in their life? Lord, help us as a church family to embrace it, love and encourage each other regardless of our marital status. We love you, Jesus, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When you're ready, I'd invite you to stand and we're going to sing together. Vast as the ocean, love and kindness as the flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Here is love, vast as the ocean, love and kindness. As the flood, when the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can see. Float a vast and gracious tide Grace and love like mighty rivers Poured in and from above And heaven's peace and perfect justice Kissed again
Vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Grace and love, like mighty rivers, poured in sunset from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. So as we're wrapping up today, Let's remember to give with joy in our hearts. That's our attitude. We're cheerful givers. You can give in boxes. You can give online. Um, Also today, there's an intro. So if you're new with us and you'd like to learn a few new things about our church, you just go to the lobby, look for the signs that say the intro, and we'd love to just explain a few things about our church to you. Um, And lastly, let me just give you a benediction here from Ephesians chapter 3. So as you're going now, Remember that Jesus Christ is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power that is at work within you so that he may be glorified in the church and in this world forever and ever. Amen. Have a great Sunday, everybody.